Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before I introduce our return guest, with whom I have a lot to discuss, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Chessable's got some great new courses out here in January of 2024, including Friend of the Pod, Chess Explained. I am Christoph Zalecki's first opening repertoire for Black. Christoph actually recently did a walkthrough for Perpetual Chess Patreon subs of the course. And even though I'm not really the target audience, I was uh, quite taken with uh, the simplistic approach. There's not that many trainable lines. So I think if you're rated below, say, 1400, it would be a great choice, but actually for trainers as well. And even if you just want an overview of an opening, you might want to check that one out. There's a free preview, of course, too. Uh, also, friend of the pod, uh, CM John Kabadai has a new course, My Opponent's Move, Identifying Threats, Mistakes, and Misconceptions. His courses are always highly reviewed, so be sure to check that out as well. And one final reminder, if you sign up for Chessable Pro, which enables you to use Move Connect to your chess.com account, it enables you to get discounts on Chessable courses. If you lo- use the link that will be in the description of this episode, it helps to support Perpetual Chess. And in fact, if you lose use that link and make a purchase uh, as a, already a Chessable Pro member, it also helps us out. Uh, so... Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest. He is a return guest. He's a two-time U.S. champion, author of the excellent book, which I often recommend, Learn to Play Chess Like a Boss. He is a uh, semi-retired from competitive chess. He's worked in the hedge fund industry. He's also an expert on uh, computers and chess. Uh, In our prior interview, which listeners should definitely check out if you have not already, he talked about working on Viswanathan Anand's world championship team in the 1990s. He still follows top chess closely in addition to competing in the U.S. Senior Invitational on an annual basis. And as I said, we've got a lot to talk about. So um, with all that's been happening in the chess world, so I'm excited to welcome back to the program Grandmaster Patrick Wolf. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, Ben. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, there's, we, this has been in the works for a few weeks, and my list of topics to discuss has just grown and grown. Um, yeah, it's a gift that keeps on giving, uh, <laughs> PDA is, isn't it? It really is. Well said. So for listeners, we're recording this on January 2nd. It will likely be out on January 9th. So apologies in advance for whatever crazy thing happens in in the coming week. But we've got a lot to catch up on just from the previous month. So Patrick, to kick things off, I thought it might be fun if I did a countdown of five crazy stories that have not yet been covered on Perpetual Chess, and you can riff on them as much or as little as you want as we go through them, because we have pl- plenty of fodder. So, okay. Okay. So number five is one of the more recent controversies. And we'll also, of course, uh, be talking about actual events like the FIDE World Rapid and Blitz recently wrapped up. The candidate spots are finally determined. So in addition to the chess drama, we'll be getting to the chess news, but uh, they kind of intermix these days. So anyway, uh, event number one was there was a controversy surrounding a prearranged draw between uh, Jan Napomnici and Grandmaster Daniil Dubov. Uh, basically, it's fairly common, as Patrick can discuss, for professional level players to agree to a draw. But this one was particularly egregious because they just moved their knights around back and forth. It was, didn't even resemble. It wasn't like a Berlin draw. It didn't resemble a chess game. And they ended up being forfeited, double forfeited in the game. Uh, in terms of uh, mitigating circumstances, Dubov later said that he was frustrated with um, the organization of the FIDE World Rapid and Blitz. I think in particular, there was a ruling that took a long time that made the tournament very delayed in uh, clock controversy. And there was also, uh, in a prior round, Dubov had been paired against Artemyev, who showed up without a badge and therefore wasn't allowed in the hall. So Dubov, like, ended up getting a time advantage and felt weird about that whole situation. So anyway, it also raised this broader issue of prearranged draws in chess. So Patrick, were you following this particular story? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I was following it super closely, but I saw the video. um, So I I saw the way they moved the knights around. Um, I assume it was really a three-time repetition, but since the knights, they were not actually the same knights, I, I didn't count to make absolutely sure it was three times of the <laughs> same pieces and, and does it matter if they're actually different nights? But anyway, uh, leaving that aside, I did follow it. I think at some point we should probably really dive into what I think is the larger and much more important issue, which is FIDE itself. Um, but first, just riffing on this, I, uh, on this particular issue, this particular event, um, incident, I guess. Look, um, it's a, 
It's an ongoing uh, tension in chess, this whole notion of prearranged draws, right? Um, because you can't really stop two people from making a draw if they decide to do so. And so there really needs to be some kind of understanding between the organizer of an event and the players about what's expected, both in terms of whether prearranged draws in and of themselves are expected sort of you know to be allowed or tolerated or not. And if a draw is to be prearranged or if, if the players desire to make a draw, then um, what that is supposed to look like. And I think ideally in a well-functioning event between organizers and players, there really should be a shared understanding. And I think what this shows is um, there, there clearly, this clearly was some breakdown in communication, right? Um, there wasn't really an understanding between the organizers and the players. I think what they did, I think what Dubov and uh, 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 Nip -Nip Nipamachi did was cheeky. Um, I don't think double forfeiting was really the right response. I think most people agree with that. But I think the bigger issue is that there really, there should be an understanding, a, you know, a, a, a shared understanding um, that's mutually agreed upon and honored between organizers and events and players. And, and this just shows that that wasn't the case here. Yeah, well said. And we'll certainly be getting, I mean, a lot of the the top five that I'm highlighting um, have to do with FIDE. So, yeah. so we'll definitely be be covering that. And I think there's a through line in a few of the events and just that the, the rules are not that clear. But this did seem particularly egregious. And for further context, there was actually um, Chess Base India had a, a video of them talking before the round. So there was no even, I mean, with the way they played the game, since they didn't even attempt to make it look sporting, there wouldn't have been a lot of plausible deniability anyway, but there especially wasn't because they were caught basically on video saying, like, should we just do a silly prearranged draw? Well, um, I mean, sure, but <laughs> I don't need to see the video. I And I did see the video of them talking, but that's kind of beside the point. Right, in this case, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and it's not, I mean, obviously when they do this, like when two grandmasters do this, they are doing it both to be funny and to tell everybody that it was a prearranged draw, right? But I mean, like, you know, if you play like, I mean, there are several opening lines that everybody knows are just forced repetitions. And is it, is it really so different, right? Again, right. it really goes to the, the shared understanding and um, that's mutually accepted between the organizers and the players. And that, clearly that was lacking here. And if I were to make you chess czar, do you have a sense of like what rule you would implement in terms of uh, clear guidelines? Yeah, I mean, look, I there are some things that are right or wrong, sort of in kind of an absolute sense. There are some things that really just need to be agreed upon. And I think this falls into the latter camp, right? Like... I don't think there's some like absolute sense of what should the players do and what should the organizers accept or or tolerate or forbid. I think it needs to be agreed upon. I understand why organizers wouldn't want to see something like this. I think, and we'll probably get to this, there's the whole shoes thing. I'm sure oh, we'll yeah. get to that story. Like, I think what what really struck people as kind of galling about uh, Fide's action here is there isn't really any sense in which what um, these two players did harmed the tournament. You know, it it's not like this was a critical um, round, you know, a critical game for the results of the tournament that was receiving an enormous amount of attention, right? This was just a game. 
it, it didn't really matter that much. And so I imagine that's and they didn't really feel like playing. And I think that that's why they did what they did. And the organizers were angry because they felt like it was kind of a, a thumb in the eye. OK, that's all understandable. The response was kind of overly punitive because probably they were angry and they were kind of lashing out. And that's a dysfunctional relationship. Right. And I think that's kind of that's sort of what what everybody was getting at. Is chess czar like let's let I mean, let's be more realistic. If I were the organizer of the tournament, I probably would not like to see a game like this. OK, so I'd probably want to have a conversation with the players at the beginning of the tournament and say, um, if if prearranged draws are going to be allowed or, you know, let's say we're not going to try to forbid them because in practice, it's pretty hard. You can implement certain rules, right? You can't agree to a draw before move 40, you know, that, that sort of thing. Right. And some players, sometimes they do that. But let's suppose for the sake of argument, say, like, we're not going to forbid prearranged draws. Um, however, uh, we want you to be respectful of this tournament. And part of being respectful, we feel, is if you're going to have a prearranged draw, that it should be done by playing a normal opening line that ends in a, you know, that correctly ends in a repetition or something like that. Yeah. And there are all sorts of ways that, right, you can handle it. And I think it, there's no right way to handle it, except that it has to be handled in a way that is, um, you know, a, a conversation, mutual understanding, respectful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's th that's what I would want to do as an organizer. Yeah, yeah, and I do think it's a valid. It's an important point that you highlighted that that you can't really, unfortunately, the nature of chess is unlike in other sporting competitions, you can't really prevent a draw. I mean, it's 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 you can't. Natural state. I mean, I mean, you can look. There are ways you there are ways you can do it to be really extreme, right? You can. You can forbid a draw before move 40, um, except in cases where computer analysis. Should, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can try to do. But I think more realistically, it needs to be a shared understanding between the players and the organizers. And I think and we should really probably get to we should get to other events and we should probably get to like FIDE itself. Because yeah. I think that's the deeper issue here. But just to put a just to put a pin in this particular episode or this particular incident, uh, that's the way I see it. Is it's it's a fail as the famous line goes, it's a failure of communication, right? It, right, like it's a failure to communicate. That's what's real. Okay. That's what really happened here. Okay, and we will move on to the next event. And like I said, they're they're all FIDE related. I did just want to add something I should have mentioned earlier. The the punitive um, ruling that Patrick alludes to is that Nepo and Dubov, instead of getting the half point from the draw, were each given zero points uh, in that game. And, uh, and you know, Dubov finished quite high. So while it didn't immediately make an impact on the result, I mean, at that moment, it didn't dictate the result. It certainly may have um, in the sort of uh, macro perspective, but um, but for our next crazy event, you already alluded to, <laughs> to this one. Um, this one is also somewhat, this is the second sort of frivolous one, although not frivolous for the, the, the person to whom it happened. Um, Ranamaya Kazarian, a uh, top Dutch woman player, um, was wearing basically sporty, I mean, not sporty, sorry, um, nice uh, like dress sneakers. And apparently they, that violated FIDE's dress code and she was fined for it and alerted at the end of her game. Um, it actually got picked up by the New York Times, among many other publications. And so FIDE, it's to me normal to have a dress code, but it just didn't seem to have clear guidelines and um, yeah, didn't seem to cast a great light on the organization. Uh, when this made such a big story. What was what was your reaction to this one, Patrick? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I agree with everything you said. I, I think that in, actually this is a worse, uh, this is a, a worse behavior by FIDE or whoever the particular people were who made this decision for a couple of reasons. One is, look, let's just be clear. I think this is very sexist. Like, yeah. I, th like this is just sort of clearly sexist. It is very hard to imagine that, um, something similar would have been done uh, to uh, a male chess player, 
but it was done to a female chess player. Now, you, you can't prove it statistically, right? But I think common sense, like, I think we can all, a, a person coming to this with an open mind, with just sort of a common sense perspective, there's definite sexism here. The only thing that would dissuade me from this is if the people who made this decision were all women or something like that, which I have to believe is not the case. Um, right. But uh, at, at any rate, okay, so let's just sort of put that on the table. But a couple other things. Um, the putative harm to FIDE here is by not following the dress code, there is uh, sort of a, uh, it, it downgrades the professionalism or, you know, sort of the, you know, it degrades the professionalism of the event. I saw the shoes. They're obviously nice shoes, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the offense here seems to be that they're made of canvas as opposed to leather um, or something similar. I don't know. I don't know how they would feel about suede. I mean, like, but this is like sort of like veering into the absurd, right? right. Like you just actually see the shoes. They, they are perfectly fine shoes. <laughs> and I'm not a fashion person, but it's just sort of kind of obvious on the face of it that um, like there's nothing here that, I mean, leave aside whether the dress code was well enough specified. Like, I don't think a reasonable person would look at these shoes and say somehow this is, you know, degrading the professionalism event. That's just kind of absurd. Um, and so I think the enforcement of this was beyond being sexist was also just stupid. Um, but then I think there's something else, and it, again, we really need to get to FIDE itself. But this gets to, you know, in the, in the last incident, we talked about a sort of lack of proper communication. But here, I think we're seeing something more disturbing, which is a kind of antagonistic, punitive relationship between the organizers of the event and the players, right? So this woman... She's not a star, right? She's not somebody who has uh, power or notoriety within the or, uh, sort of fame, you know, within the chess world, right? She's, in other words, she's someone who can easily be pushed around, or at least they, like, she's just an ordinary player, right? And um, there's just a basic lack of respect that was kind of masqueraded as, well, you violated this dress code. But of course, as, as, as is obvious to everybody, it's not clear that there's, you can't look at the dress code and these shoes and say, oh, yes, it's very clear that this was a violation. And so, and so I think that there's a, a kind of dysfunctional relationship between um, FIDE officials and the players that's revealed in an incident like this. Um, and so over and above the underlying sexism, which is a more sort of general trend, uh, per, sort of a pervasive issue here, I think we're, we're, we're seeing something. It's easy for me to imagine a different kind of antagonistic, um, disrespectful uh, action, uh, you know, the FIDE officials could have taken towards a male player. And so I think it goes beyond sexism. It goes to the actual relationship between the players and the organizers. Although, of course, it's also true that in general, the female players have less power than the male players. So there's sort of that dynamic going on as well. But I think mm -hmm. it like it, it's it's a funny sort of trivial little issue. But I think it kind of reveals some things that are that are not good. Yeah, well said. Um, I agree. And yeah, I mean, again, the fact that it made headlines like this, like my wife does not follow chess at all, but she's the one that told me about the article. And she, you know, they had a picture of the shoes in the New York Times article. And she said, these are nicer than any shoes I that have. for ridiculous, listeners. obviously. <laughs> for any listeners who didn't see them, they're, as Patrick said, canvas, Burberry, expensive sneakers. Um, so patently absurd. Apologies to Anna and I'm um, the player who was um, subjected to this, and as you said, so probably uh, speaks to a broader issue. And of course, also getting back to the prior incident, 
um, there just seemed to be, it seemed so um, haphazard because, you know, you have players wearing sort of uh, long sleeve t-shirts, sometimes with sponsors emblazoned on them, some of the top players, um, you know, maybe those should be allowed, maybe they should not, but they certainly, it wasn't like everyone was wearing a suit and she was wearing these sneakers. So, um, you know, players wearing hoodies, et cetera. So uh, just lack of organization and definitely some sexism, as you said. So we're getting closer to the main issue as we hit on points number three and four, which are, or events number three and four, which are closely related. I guess we'll take them separately, but uh, uh, listeners are probably familiar with all that's been going on in the fight for candidates spots. Um, the Most of the spots, as I talked about on a podcast with Fyakoslav Niemic a couple months back, had been determined, but the rating spot actually became far more contested than I initially thought, uh, got very close, and was within points going into December. And as a lot of you probably heard, there were players scrambling to play events. Linear D- Dominguez showed up to play uh, at Sunway Sitges in Spain, and uh, a, a last-minute, very... High-level tournament was organized in Chennai, India as well uh, to help out some of the Indian players, although, you know, very competitive and uh, tournament that was on the up and up. And then Ali Reza Faruja at the last second uh, with some people helping him organize the tournament where he lives in Chartres, France, uh, that was basically like five fairly inactive grandmasters uh, and him that looked orchestrated just to get him the points, although there was a twist at the end as he ended up not getting the points uh, that needed for that. And Fide actually then uh, post hoc ruled that it wouldn't have counted anyway. But obviously there's a second half to this story, Patrick, but let's let's start there. What was your reaction to this, uh, you know, the overall organization and to the fact that Ali Reza then sort of last minute organized the tournament to try to gain rating points to get the um, rating spot? Well, so again, we, we need... We need to really address FIDE, the organization, because that's the main thing. But let's talk about this first, this particular incident first. Um, clearly, they sim- FIDE simply made a mistake in how it uh, decided the ratings qualification for the candidates, the spot in the candidates would work, right? And I think I saw a podcast with... Um, Carolina maybe that just that um, described this discussed this but I think it's, it's pretty straightforward that and I believe it was done this way in the past it should have been an average of some number of rating lists rather than a photo like you, you take the photo on December 31st and whoever has uh, like the, the top rating in that moment precisely for this reason that what you've now done by by doing it this way you've now created the incentive for people to essentially organize events and that you don't have to believe that anybody's cheating you can just say like look we're going to try to organize events to 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 create purely for the for the purpose of creating the ability for player X, Y, Z to try to gain another 10 10 rating points or whatever in the last couple of days or weeks or whatever. Um, And understandably, you'd rather not do that. Okay, so Fide screwed up. Having then screwed up, they can't then post hoc say, well, we're actually going to disallow this. Right. Like, this is just crazy, right? Like, like, you, yes, they should have designed a different set of rules. But they, but they designed a given set of rules. Like, you've got to live with the rules that you designed, right? And, um, and it, it, it's just, it shows two things that are both troubling but the second thing is much more troubling than the first thing. The first thing it shows is incompetence, which is troubling enough on, on, the, on the part of FIDE. But the second thing it shows uh, is capriciousness, right? Mm-hmm. Arbitrariness. And, and that's even worse. So I think what the through line of these events 
that we're sort of seeing. And I like the way you stack them because I think they sort of like show them in sort of more and more dramatic fashion is we're showing sort of an underlying corruption. I don't mean financial corruption. I mean, just sort of corruption in terms of just the, the, the ability of FIDE to do what it's, what it's supposed to be able to do or what we want it to be able to do. And I think like this is, this is why people are responding so strongly to these events. Cause, cause we're all sensing this, that like yeah. something's kind of rotten at the core here. Yeah. Which is, uh, we're also building towards that. And then event number f- <laughs> number four, closely related. So, and as you say, so they didn't even, so once it, once the event started the uh, Faruja arranged specifically to gain rating points, they said, we might, decide not to allow this we're, we're going to rule on it later and only later did they you know, as you say post hoc um say that it wouldn't have counted but it, he ended up not getting the rating points anyway so he ended up playing in a big open tournament in uh elsewhere in france in um rouen france so he ended up being the top seed gata Komsky was the second seed and this one was planned for months he was just someone who dropped out of the fide world and blitz played this event instead um, and needed to get a perfect score to get the points and actually did get a perfect score. So, uh, you know, it would have been really, um, um, un, you know, un, unimaginable for them not to count this, but this does count and Faruja does get the last candidate spot. But uh, any reaction to this one? I mean, at least they didn't overreach <laughs> even more. I mean, I don't see anything. I mean, that I don't see anything wrong about. I mean, yeah. the system is probably a bad system, but fine. Um, I don't see anything wrong. And Faruja is obviously a terrific. Uh, I mean, look, I, I mean, Dominguez would be great too, but Faruja's, I mean, I, I, as an American, obviously I'd love to see uh, uh, Dominguez in there. And then he's a terrific player and he's one and be wonderful for him to be in the candidates. Um, but Faruja obviously, you know, represents the rising generation, is tremendously talented, is, is an extremely worthy participant so great um so nothing yeah to yeah ex- i'm excited as a chess fan that he'll be in the tournament even though this was a uh not a not the way i i would have preferred for for the spot to be determined um and number five which gets us to what we've been alluding to num- um all along the perhaps broader issues with FIDE. Um, and this actually, this news is perhaps the oldest. I mean, about two weeks from prior to when we're recording, it was announced that FIDE had approved to remove term limits for uh, its president, uh, Dvorkovich. So uh, he can stay as long as he wants as FIDE president. So not only are they, uh, you know, um, haphazardly managing things and uh, creating PR disasters left and right, but uh, they they can do so for for the foreseeable yeah. future all right so i mean so obviously this is this is bad but i don't even want to talk about that in particular i think i think everybody sh- can and should recognize that that's a bad thing let's talk about fide okay so i'm 55 i'll be i'll be 56 in a month and a half and um I've been playing chess, or I, I don't really play chess seriously anymore, but I started playing chess seriously when I was like 10 or something, and I sort of came of age and as a teenager. So my memory of FIDE really starts with Florenzio Campomanes. Before that, you had Olufsen, right? And... Um, my understanding, but it's not my personal experience, it's just my understanding, that was that FIDE before Campomanes was a reasonably functional organization. And, um, and it was a different time for chess. Um, broadly speaking, we can say it's the pre-Fisher you know, so let's call it the pre, you know, sort of Fisher Spassky match, sort of the 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 era of chess when chess tournaments, chess was not the way we would think of as sort of a professional sport or whatever word you want to use, but sort of a professional um, uh, entertainment 
and sporting activity. It, you know, this is the era of the 19, you know, the post World War II, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, you know, it's it, it was a different era. And FIDE operated reasonably well, I, I think, at least that's my understanding. Although maybe somebody who understands, who knows the history better would contradict me on that. But what I can certainly say is that Campomanes definitely was a turn for the worse in terms of just the inherent corruption of FIDE. And they've never looked back. Mm-hmm. I mean, so that... For what I presume is your entire life, Ben, and is essentially my entire chess life, really. And for a long time, FIDE has been a corrupt, dysfunctional organization. And that corruption has waxed and waned, and that dysfunction has waxed and waned. But I don't think anybody who is knowledgeable about FIDE would dispute that uh, you're, you're not looking at an organization that's really sort of been well run or has really um, produced for chess. And so I remember um, when Gary Kasparov um, formed the Professional Chess Association and before that, the Grandmasters Association. I'm old enough to remember the Grandmasters Association. And, you know, I knew Gary and that was I was not deeply involved, but I knew Gary and, and had some conversations with him about and supported very much what he was doing. I was Vichy second in the in the Professional Chess Association's World Championship match in 1995 in New York, and we considered that the real World Championship match and so on. So, so there have been efforts in the past to supersede or replace FIDE. And separately from those efforts, Chess has become a much more professional, uh, it's flourished in many ways, right? There's, it, and I mean, the internet um, and computers are wonderful for chess, right? The world is globalized, has, has globalized a lot, continues to globalize. I mean, I'm again, I'm old enough to remember when there was a Soviet Union and when the Soviet Union dominated chess, um, the, the surviving countries of the Soviet Union do not in any way dominate chess anymore, which is a good thing because it's a it's many more countries have many more great players and so on and so forth. Um, chess has, has is, it continues to sort of grow up, right? And I think chess probably many years ago, but certainly today, has outgrown FIDE. And what we need to do, we don't need to reform FIDE. Mm -hmm. I don't think FIDE is reformable. We need to get beyond FIDE. I don't even think we need to replace FIDE, right? I think we just need to get beyond FIDE. All right. So what does FIDE have that makes it important? I was sort of thinking about that before this um, uh, discussion. I think I'd love to hear your thoughts, Ben, but I think there are three things in my mind that really FIDE has. One, FIDE has um, the ratings. Two, FIDE uh, has the titles, the Grandmaster, International Master, and the various assorted titles, which matter. I mean, I can tell you, like, the world actually, the, the title of Grandmaster actually means something, right? And then three... FIDE has the World Chess Championship, which mm-hmm. had been taken, you know, it's like was away, taken away, but now has come back. And all right. I think those, and there are other events, obviously, that FIDE organizes, the, you know, the Olympiad, various other championships, um, the World Junior Championship, the Women's World Championship, and so on and so forth. But I think really sort of like if someone were to, to, to create a world chess championship that was completely distinct and separate from FIDE that people recognize, I think it would be pretty straightforward to create a lot of the other events under it. Although, you know, maybe, maybe people might dispute that. I don't know. Um, But I think those are the three things. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I agree. I mean, the only other question 
to me and what you say. I mean, obviously, like I'm a big fan of the World Cup and the FIDE World Rapid and Blitz, but like those could be given different names. It's not that it's not so much that they have like a venerated tradition as they're like uh, entertaining events. Right. Um, so the other question that occurred to me was just money. Like, you know, uh, often the finances of these events are so opaque that we don't know in, you know, in a separate world, I certainly with a world championship, you feel like FIDE might be doing more harm than good. Oh, I think, but- I, look, I, if you, if you separate out those assets, sort of the title, the world, the, uh, and I would think, I, I think actually really the continuity of the world, because that's really what matters, the continuity yeah. of the world championship title. Um, the ratings and the titles, the you know grandmaster and, and so forth. Uh, take those assets, separate those assets out. I think there's absolutely no question that FIA is a net negative, not a net positive in terms of raising money. I mean, I had a conversation with Peter Thiel many years ago, and I asked him whether he might uh, be interested in uh, uh, being patron for World Chess Championship. And Peter is a you know is a chat is a very rich man billionaire many times over um, and um, and a chess player and, and I think genuinely loves chess uh, I know he genuinely loves chess um, he's never really supported chess in any in any way uh, but when I asked him specifically about the world championship I mean one thing he's in fact his immediate response to me was well you know I mean I asked a couple people about. FIDE, and they said, like, you just can't get involved because, like, they're just so corrupt. I think FIDE just chases a lot of people and organizations away, right? Because nobody wants to be involved with such a a corrupt, um, demonstrably corrupt organization. Um, But I I think really what needs to happen is the players and other powerful entities in chess and i'm thinking primarily of chess.com i i I don't know if there's anybody else that you know has the same level of of sort of power and 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 resources um and obviously for the players i mean magnus carlson sort of the world chess champion always is much, 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 much more than first among equals. And in particular, Magnus is deservedly a world superstar and is, you know, although he is not currently the world chess champion in classical chess, everybody knows he is the best chess player. Um, And so it really is Magnus um, that you need. Um, But like the, the top players and that, and Magnus and, you know, maybe with chess.com and maybe with some others, like I think chess would be very well served if those players and entities were somehow to work together to say, we need to just create um, a new structure. Again, forget about trying to reform FIDE. I think it's hopeless. I think it's like completely hopeless. I think that what needs to happen is a new structure needs to be created. And Gary Kasparov tried. Um, he really, to his great credit, tried in the 1990s. And we can, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about the history of why that didn't succeed ultimately. But I think the, and you know, people might disagree on this, and there's all sorts of stories about what actually happened and the people involved and so forth. But I think a big piece of it is chess wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the big sponsor of the uh, Professional Chess Association World Chess Championship in 1995 was Intel, right? And there was an attempt to uh, uh, to put on TV the World Chess Championship and some other chess events. But TV is a terrible, terrible medium for chess, right? Well, we're, we're about 30 years beyond that now. And now we've got the internet and social media and all that stuff. And that's a great medium for chess. And I think it's much, much more um, commercially viable. I mean, we've seen it, obviously, like it just is more commercially viable. And I think we would, I think chess would be very well served if, uh, if the powers that be within chess 
were to figure out how to um, replace and recreate those critical assets that FIDE still controls. I think the re the the ratings are pretty straightforward, right? Like, rate. I mean, this nobody copyrights the formula, right? Like, and everybody understands who the top players are, and so I think the the ratings are pretty straightforward. Now, ratings is not just ratings; they are the infrastructure of of rating chess tournaments, right? And and that requires organization and that requires people. And that's part of what FIDE has. There's just an infrastructure of people who are trained arbiters and who submit results and receive results and so on and so forth. All of that, though, can be reproduced, right? It's just a question of creating that infrastructure. And there's a lot of people, I think, who would be willing to do it. So there's that. I think the titles, um, that would... To my knowledge, nobody has made an effort to try to recreate the titles. Uh, I, recreate's not the right way to put it. Like you start by honoring all of the existing grandmasters and international masters and women grandmasters and FIDE masters and so on and so forth, right? And then you create an infrastructure that for granting new titles. Um, you know, again, that's going to take work but all very doable. And then, of course, the world championship. And, and for the world championship, there's no way around it. What you need is Magnus Carlsen. Yeah. Right. I mean, we have, of course, a FIDE world champion in Ding Luren, right? And nobody takes seriously Ding Luren, obviously a terrific chess player, but nobody takes seriously the idea that he is the quote unquote world champion. He just happens to hold the title of FIDE world chess champion. Right. Or for classical chess, whatever that title actually is. Um, and there's an inf like it, it requires Magnus Carlsen and requires Magnus Carlsen not only because for the world championship itself, but it requires Magnus Carlsen because it requires the commercial viability of chess and the commercial viability of chess is deeply tied up with. Magnus Carlsen himself and whoever is perceived as, you know, whoever is known as the best chess player in the world and is the person people really care about and all that stuff. Now, unfortunately, I mean, I don't know Magnus. I barely know Magnus at all. And I'm pretty confident that I, I doubt Magnus would even know my, recognize my name. We did meet once and talk. I'm pretty confident he doesn't remember that. There's no reason why he should. So he, doesn't know bupkis about me and I don't know anything about him except what I observe and what, you know, people say about him in conversations and, and, and publicly and so forth. It does seem to me that unfortunately Magnus Carlsen doesn't have an interest in this. Um, I mean, Gary Kasparov, again, to his great credit, had an interest in it and was really committed to it for a number of years. Whatever else you think about Gary, like he really did care and really did try and nobody after him really has or did. Um, but I think it would be great if that were to be done. And we now have a new player in the equation, which is chess.com. Like we've never had before a corporate entity in chess that had real resources and, and, and influence and power. Now we do. Um, and I think it would be great. I really don't know what chess.com, like whether, you know, the folks at chess.com even think about this or, or, you know, contemplate it. They obviously now have a very close relationship with Magnus Carlsen of having acquired play Magnus, whatever it was a year and a half ago or something. Um, but, um, I think that's what's necessary. And, um, and I hope that something like that will happen. I'm not holding my breath for it, but I hope something like that will happen because that's the only way um, that really, and it would be wonderful for chess. I'm convinced of that. Like, I think it would be purely from a, as a commercial investment. Like if all you care about is just like bringing up 
dollar signs or euro signs or whatever, like from the game of chess. Like, I think on a sort of 10 to 15 year time horizon, it would be great because FIDE is awful for chess and cannot be reformed. And we just need to get beyond it. That's my, that's what I think. Yeah. Well said. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I, I also don't know Magnus at all, um, but I share your impression that it doesn't seem like he's the personality type where he would want to spearhead this sort of initiative. Um, another potential issue that came to mind, this might be like small in the list of the sort of uh, pecking order of things that matter, but he do you know, he wouldn't want to play a classical championship. Um, so even if you could get the sort of top line sign off on a match, it, it wouldn't retain the formula if Magnus is involved. But, you know, I mean, one never knows, right? Like right. one could imagine, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but one could imagine a world where if Magnus Carlson and chess.com, you know, got together and organized some of the top players and really made an effort, I could imagine a world where Magnus Carlsen says, says, hey, actually, this is pretty interesting, right? Like, yeah. I'm still good enough that I feel like I can be the world chess champion. And, I, you know, now I actually really have a stake in this as an organization, not just as a, as a chess event, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, not only my breath for it, I haven't seen any evidence that this is going to happen. Um, but if anybody out there has relationships with, um, with the top grandmasters, with Magnus, with chess.com. Like, uh, I think this is the future or this is the future we should hope for. Yeah. I don't think FIDE is the future. Yeah. And chess.com had almost organized a match between Magnus and Hikaru. Uh, the, I guess the funding fell through at the last second. It was supposed to take place this year. Yeah. I think um, I think because the funding fell through, like all of the details never came to light of like what the format would be. But I mean, it just seems like even some headline match like that might be a good start where you can sort of start to fill in the infrastructure below it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's disappointing. I feel like chess players have a lot of strengths, but I haven't noticed a big overlap between them being very detail oriented and uh, organizationally savvy uh, as like well, one of the the strengths. Well, I I wouldn't put it that way. I think um, I think there's plenty of organizational talent and capacity among chess players. It's just that it doesn't correlate with uh, your rating. Why should it? Right. right? Like, uh, but this, I mean, I, I have enormous respect for um, the chess players I've come to know over the years in terms of their intelligence and their um, creativity um, and also, obviously, the love of the game. Um, you know, it's just, it is unfortunate that. I don't think this is something that can be done without the support of the major um, like power centers, which is, I think, really Magnus Carlsen and Chess.com, and maybe there's someone else. Like, But to my mind, those are the major power centers, those two. Um, I, it doesn't necessarily have to be instigated by those two, right? Like, I mean, in, during the 1990s and the late 80s and the 90s, um, you know, it was, it was actually instigated by Gary Kasparov, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be that way, it, but it does require the support um, uh, of, of those. Um, I don't know. I mean, but, but I think that's, that's the only way forward. Um, and m maybe late 2023 will be a watershed because people will just recognize like i think everybody has known for a long time how bad fide is but this is sort of like the series of incidents sort of dramatizes it in a real way and maybe it'll be a catalyst um you know yeah. if you're optimistic um but i I'll, I'll throw my voice and my ideas out there for anyone to listen um i i really strongly believe that that's the way forward um, and not through FIDE. Yeah, I think a lot of people 
uh, share share that opinion. And Patrick, you so you mentioned uh, the PCA Kasparov's uh, failed attempt to start a separate organization, and I agree with you that the chess world wasn't ready looking back, but. In terms of like the more specific details of why it didn't work, uh, like what what do you think held it back? Um, you know, it's a good question. It's an important question, um, and I I'm not entirely sure because the arc of my professional career in chess sort of was already i was already leaving chess at the time when the pca was really ramping up its efforts so i was u.s chess champion in 1992 and 1995 um and i was vichy's second for his match against kasparov in 1995 1995 was really the last year that I was active professionally as a chess player. I was already um, at um, at Harvard at that point. I went to Yale for two years, undergraduate. I, I dropped out to play chess professionally for uh, uh, four or five years, um, five years, I think. And then I transferred into Harvard uh, as a junior. Um, I took a semester off to do all this um, stuff in the fall of 1995. Um, I went back and finished my undergraduate degree. Um, I graduated. So I, so I went back to Harvard in 1996 in the basically January of 1996. And from January of 1990, I, I graduated basically a year later. Um, I, 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 mar- I walked with people in, in whatever it was, May or June of 19, 1997. But I really... I, I actually officially graduated, I think, like in March of 1997. I basically finished my finals in January, wrote my thesis, whatever. So my profession, I played a few chess tournaments. Like I played a tournament in um, in Argentina in the spring of 1997. Um, I played one or two. I played, I think I played a chess tournament in New York sometime in 1996, if memory serves me right. I published the very first edition of the Complete Idiot's Guide to Chess in, in the uh, spring of 1997. But really, my professional chess career had ended um, with winning the U.S. Chess Championship in December of 1995. And the professional, and that was a that was a high point for the Professional Chess Association, right? Because it, it just organized the first world championship and so forth. And it really sort of petered out in the late 90s. And by that time, I was really involved in other stuff. So so this is a, a long-winded way of my saying, like, I, I don't really have firsthand knowledge of why it didn't work. And I would, I'd, I'd be loath to kind of speculate because I don't think my speculation would be very well informed. So I'm just going to fall back on... Um, I think that there was not enough commercial success of the PCA's efforts. And I think the reason there was not enough commercial success of the PCA's efforts, whatever the sort of micro level reasons are about the personalities involved and, you know, the, the Bob Rice was the person who was running the PCA and was he really the right person to do it? And, you know, Gary's brilliant and, and tremendously energetic, but also can be difficult. And, you know, how much were their personality clashes and yada, 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 yada. Like, I kind of think the macro level reason is it was, there just wasn't possible at that time, or at least they were not successful at that time. And I think probably because it was very hard, if not impossible at that time, to really make chess commercially successful through the media available at the time, which is basically television, Mm -hmm. right? But again, we're in a very different world now. And I'm completely convinced that the commercial and media success is there for the taking. Um, what it requires are the, the the players, and I don't mean just the chess players, but I mean the specific actors. And 
maybe other people, like I'm sure Hikaru Nakamura, for example, could be very helpful in this. And, and you know, there were some, you know, like, and what's his name, uh, who does Gotham Chess? Um, yeah. Like, there awesome. are other actors out there who I'm sure could actually be quite um, helpful in this in this effort. But it does seem to me that, like, Magnus Carlsen and Chess.com are probably the two key elements that you really need there. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to. I hope. I hope that there is some movement. We we will see. Um, it's been <laughs> we've we've had this system for a long time. So, it, uh, so and I really climb. do want to emphasize. Like, I do think that just purely from a commercial perspective, it would be a huge plus for chess. Yeah, but it requires a concerted effort and commitment to. Re- recreate, replace, supersede the infrastructure that's currently provided by FIDE. Um, trying to repair or reform it, I think, is completely hopeless. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to talk about your career, Patrick, but there's also the, the while FIDE exists, um, and of course we've got the candidates three months away. We've we've got the candidates spots sorted um are you able to still sort of get excited for an event like that um you know with with this backdrop i'm always able to get excited for chess but i would say that um like my attitude towards this is it's less that i'm excited about it from a sporting perspective and i'll just be really pleased to follow the chess yeah that makes sense and as you said the fact that Faruja um earned one of the last spots uh should make it more entertaining and of course uh uh Caruana Nakamura Loren it, I mean it it's well I guess Ding won't be in the candidates but it should be interesting um Magnus of course dominant performance at the World Rapid and Blitz I guess there's no real news there but impressive nonetheless He's a good chess player <laughs> He really is Yeah and um Congratulations to the winners of the women's section as well. Uh, Gunina won for the second time. And congratulations to Anastasia Badnarik for winning the Rapid over Humpy Canaro. So the FIDE women's candidates, the spots had mostly been determined and even Humpy Canaro was way ahead on reading and did get the last spot. So we'll look forward to both of those events in April in Toronto. But meanwhile, Patrick, you're occasionally playing chess. I've had the uh, privilege of interviewing a couple participants in the U.S. senior, Gregory Kadanov and the winner, Melikachi. And of course, I've interviewed other participants as well, but those subsequent to the most recent event. Um, so where where is your chess when you, when you uh, come out of retirement for that event? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so I think you said you introduced me as sort of uh, annually participated, but actually this is only the second time I participated in the U.S. Senior Championship. The first time was in 2020, pandemic year, and I really was able to do it both because the pandemic meant that I had a lot more time at home and also because uh, I was competing at home. It was just over a weekend, and um, and so I worked hard to, for that event. Um, I, You know, the stars aligned for me again. I had the time to do it and uh, not just to play, but also really to prepare. So I spent a couple of months, I worked very hard um, and prepared for the event. It was a lot of fun in the end, and I'm very glad that I did it. I will say it was frustrating the first three rounds because I lost my first three games. And I really saw the rust in those first three games. Um, so my first game, I lost to Gregory Kadano. And the reason I lost, it's, it's, it's frustrating, but also fascinating. So... He surprised me like I expected him to play something different than what he did. What he actually played was E4. And then um, when I played the knight or if he played the bishop E3 line, um, you know, he, he didn't have any sort of home preparation. It's just he played a line I didn't expect him to play. And what that means was that I had to remember how to play what I play. Hmm. And we got to a perfectly normal position and I simply did not play the right move. I mean, if you look it up in chess base, it's like there's like 1,500 games where everybody plays the correct move and like seven games where they play the move I play, which is not a good move. And I just immediately got a very bad position um, and and I lost. Um, and I'll talk about the next two games um, in a minute, but 
that really highlighted one of the things I discovered about my ability to play chess as I've gotten older and um, and that game, which is um, I am just not capable of holding in my brain the same amount of new information that I used to be able to hold in my brain. I can understand it perfectly well, right? Like I can analyze the openings. I have beautiful notes. Like I, I've done the analysis with my, my engine and, I, and, I, and I've organized everything and I understand it and I get it. I just can't freaking remember it at right. the board. And of course, obviously, Chess has there's much, much, much more to remember now than there was when I was playing 30 years ago. But it's really striking. One of the things I've so let's take the Nidor. Specifically, Bishop E3. You can play E6, like if you really know what you're doing, I think you can make the E6 lines work, but it's clear that E5 is just a better move against six bishop e3, and so that's what people generally play. And I certainly played it 30 years ago. So so I did. So 30 years ago. I had well worked out theory against e5 knight f3 because back in the old days um, in the 1990s knight f3 was the more um, common response. Knight b3, you know, people played it, but it was not nearly as common. Well, now of course knight b3 is, you know, if anything, probably the main line. Although obviously knight f3 is also a main move. Um, but the point is, I don't have what I like to call muscle memory from the 1990s of knight b3. I only have muscle memory of knight f3. All right. So in round four, I played against a Copian, and he played knight bishop e3, e5. He played knight f3. Now, I had prepared for that game the night before because I had expected that line, and so it was fresh. But what I can also tell you, and I also worked everything out, like the theory has advanced in 30 years. But although the theory has advanced in 30 years, it has advanced, I would say, much more incrementally. And a lot of the lines are well known. As a matter of fact, there's a critical setup in, that I actually helped develop the theory of 30 years ago. And I played a very nice line against, uh, damn, now I can't, I can't remember his name. I'm betraying my age. He's really <laughs> grandmaster. Um, but I won a very nice game. And it's still an important sort of nuance in this whole setup to know. But that line I can remember much more easily from 30 freaking years ago. <laughs> but the right. work that I did like a week or like uh, maybe I did the work a couple months earlier and I refreshed my memory a week earlier, but I just, it just wasn't fresh in my head the night before. I can't goddamn remember the moves the day of. And it's intensely frustrating, but I've just come to accept like that's, that's the older brain. There are things that the older brain can do better than the younger brain, but there are things that the younger brain can do better than the older brain. And just holding that information in memory, just having it available in the memory bank so that you can switch to it when that comes up, like clearly that's a young brain versus old brain. So that was my game against Kadanov. And then um, against Max Delugi, that was much more like we got a much more um, – it was, uh, you know, like uh, d4, knight f6, bishop f4, g6, knight c3, d5, and, you know, quickly got into one of these sort of much less theoretical positions. I played that game fine in the opening, actually got a quite good position, um, and just failed to make, I just, like, it was a, it was a, it was a, like, I understood perfectly after the fact why what I played was a mistake, but I just made the wrong judgment at the moment, had a big advantage, but um, sort of grabbed a pawn and that was the wrong thing to do. I should have instead pressed the um, positional advantage. Then it was a much more equal game and eventually lost the thread and lost the game. Um, and then my third round against, um, against Shabalov, did not play, he surprised, you know, he did his sort of Shabalov thing in the opening, playing some sort of like crazy imbalanced line. I did not play it terribly well as white. He, he slipped up at one moment, allowed me a reasonably good position. And we got a critical position where 
I correctly understood what the right idea was, but I got overexcited. And instead of thinking for a minute and recognizing that I had to actually gain a tempo, bring his king up to h7, defend the h6 pawn, and then play a sacrifice, and that actually would gain a critical tempo, and then it would be just a very unclear position, and that was the right way to play. Instead, I played the, the idea in a more primitive fashion because I didn't think it through and got a bad game. And I, I kept fighting and um, and almost I actually managed to get a reasonably good position, but I was in terrible, I'm not good, but a savable position. But I, it was terrible time pressure. And it was one of these things where like, you know, the evaluation is very bad and you're just creeping up to almost sort of like 0.5 pods, but it's still a bad position. And, and then, but I was in time pressure and then I lost and deserved to lose that game. So I was, I lost my first three games. Felt like crap. Um, now, one thing I will say that I'm pleased about is I think I have a pretty good fighting temperament. Um, and I think I'm pretty resilient. So I'm not proud of the fact that I lost those first three games. And, I, and as I described, like for different reasons for each one of those three games. Right. But I will say a couple things. Uh, I, the first thing is I was able to recognize, particularly in the second and the third games. I mean, the first game, as I described, was just sort of like my memory banks weren't weren't fresh. But the second and the third games, I recognized I was not handling the nervous energy of the game properly where and it's something i hadn't i and i played a chess tournament beforehand i played a weekend swiss which i tied for first in to try to warm up because remember i hadn't played a serious like in-person tournament for you know 25 years or something wow um but i didn't really experience it until the u.s seniors and and i i was aware of what was happening which is that there's this nervous energy and you have to harness that energy. You have to be aware of it and use it. You can't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by it or try to push it away. And that's really what I was doing in the second and third um, games. I wasn't, I was moving too quickly in critical moments. I wasn't being present enough and really recognizing now there's a moment I have to think this through versus, okay, I know what I, I know what the right move is here and I, and I should play the move and conserve the time to use it when I need it. And fortunately I was able to recognize that and to course correct. And then also I was able to just like pick myself up and, and, and push back into this. So the next six games, I didn't lose any more games, and I won two out of the um, remaining six games. My game against Akopian, that was a nice game. I've, I'm quite proud of that game for a funny reason, right? Like, the opening was the opening. It was like, like I got my I, – I, I played the opening correctly, and we reached a position where Akopian had a slight advantage in the end game on black, right? But nothing serious. <laughs> And I was just able to hold the game. Like, you know, analysis afterwards shows I didn't make any mistakes. Like, I just played the damn game correctly. And I felt that I was doing a much better job of uh, channeling and using that nervous energy. I really felt like the second two-thirds of the tournament went much better than the first third. And I felt good about the second two-thirds. It's just really unfortunate that I, I had to... <laughs> I had to, to screw up the first third of the tournament to get there. But I enjoyed playing. You're going to do it again next year? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would like to be able to play again. I don't know whether I will have the time or the energy, especially because I'm busy with other things now. And we'll just have to see. Okay. So, like, how many hours prep? You said you worked pretty hard. How how much time did you put in? Oh, I put in a solid two months of wow. preparation. Of working every day? But you have to day. remember, like, I was rebuilding my opening repertoire. Yeah. You know, like, 
I now have a good opening repertoire. Like I'd need to polish it and, you know, like, but I don't think it would require another two months of work. Like it would probably require, you know, three or four weeks of work. Like each next tournament I think would requires less incremental work because I still have the, the work that I've done beforehand. Um, and I'm very good about building my notes and, and documenting everything. So I've, so I've got it there. Um, but, um, yeah, it was a solid two months of work. Okay. And you mentioned, uh, being frustrated that you struggled to sort of retain the information. Um, that's something, you know, I'm 46 and obviously not at your level, but I still compete when I can and certainly, um, have experienced feelings like that. And one thing I wonder, Patrick is, so was that just in relation to remembering opening lines or do you also, did you also notice it in terms of like losing your train of thought with calculation or like remembering much more opening lines? Okay. I would say, I think without question, there's some age effect in terms of, um, energy. Right. Um, but a lot less than on the memory side. And I think that energy is, a lot of that is just sort of getting back into the groove, like I was describing, about really being able to harness the nervous energy. Um, I do think, um, you know, I played uh, I played a, a Swiss tournament with my son um, a, a month after, which I won. It was a not not a very strong event, but um, but that was two games a day, mm -hmm. and two games a day. When I was younger, I mean, Jesus, when I was much younger, I played the Monadnock Marathon for crying out loud, where you're literally playing like from um, 10 o'clock in the morning, Saturday, um, continuously through until four o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday, like, and like you're playing at like two o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, right? Like, um, I can't even imagine doing anything like that, but like playing two games a day, that's a lot for me now. Yeah. Um, you know, this game against Joel Benjamin, for example, um, I was able to, like, I played, that was a good, tough game. No, I made one or two mistakes, but basically it was a well-played game. Like, I feel like it was clearly 2,600 plus level chess um, validated by the engine. I never lost my train throughout, but boy, was I tired afterwards. Yeah. That's interesting. And so you mentioned the engine analysis a lot in your um, in your discussion. So and this is something guests go back and forth on when when you're done your game. Obviously, you know a lot about engines, too. What's your approach? Do you just look at the game with the engine straight away or do you? I do. But that's because I'm not really trying to train. Like, I think the right way to do it. But I'm not a professional chess player anymore, right? So I, I don't have the energy and the time to put into doing it the right way. But the right way to do it is to analyze the game afterwards yourself without the engine. Anal like, and I mean like take a day right. and really, really, really analyze it. Pour yourself into that game. And then go back and do it with the engine. And obviously the engine will show all the, all the things that you missed. But you, what you want to analyze with the engine is what did you miss at the board? And what did you miss in your analysis? And really, like, like internalize that. I'm convinced that's the right way to do this. But, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you're no, not going to do that. I don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> but, but, to... but a person who really, really, really wants to get better at chess, like that's the way to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, yeah, and... I also think, by the way, and I'd love to talk about this. I think I think we're in the golden age of of chess openings with chess engines right now. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, we are still at a time when there are things to discover. And look, and I'll describe this, I'll describe specifically what I have in mind, but like I discovered like some interesting new theory in chess using the engine. I promise you, if I'm discovering new stuff with the engine, there's a lot of stuff out there to discover with the engine, right? right. Like um, it's not going to be like that 
at some point in the future. And I don't know how long in the future, 10 years, five years, 20 years, whatever it is, right? But let's just arbitrarily say 10 to 20 years from now. At some point in the future, arbitrarily, let's say it's 10 to 20 years from now, for all intents and purposes, chess theory will be completely mapped out and, and cataloged. We will have essentially the engine version of the encyclopedia of chess openings. Only it will be infinitely more massive. It will be all, all in computer database format. And chess opening preparation will be 0% discovery. What it will be is navigating this entire sort of virtual encyclopedia to decide what you want to try to do against the opponent to get the, you know, to try to um, uh, see if you can maneuver the game into something you know that the opponent doesn't know and all of that, right? And you'll have to like, th that. It, but it will be navigating fixed map, let's say. Um, it's inevitable, right? But we're not there yet. I don't think we're nowhere near uh, there yet. And so we're in this golden age where there's an enormous amount of theory, but there's still a lot of stuff to be discovered, which is amazing. This is like so cool. As, and enjoy it because it isn't going to last. Yeah. It's, at some point in the future, it's all going to get mapped out. And, you know, it's, chess is still going to be a great game and, and all that stuff. But it's going to like the, the way we think about chess opening preparation is going to be different than the way it is now when we're still effectively discovering new stuff. But at some point, the cataloging becomes comprehensive and complete enough that for all intents and purposes, there's really no more discovering new stuff. There's much more just navigating what's known and then you know just playing the game from there but yeah. i think we're in a golden age and i think it's it's neat hopefully we can get the new governing body up and running while the golden age is still going on yeah i mean again this is a great time for chess and i think there is tremendous potential but it will it requires the major actors to uh, to do it. I don't think it can be done without them. They don't have to necessarily instigate it, but I think they do need to cooperate and and um, and collaborate. Okay. And Patrick, before we let you go, any other sort of new developments on the AI front, the chess and AI front? I know you're always uh, tracking these stories closely. Well. I appreciate what you said about my book, um, and uh, I'm going to put a plug in for my book. So um, I will say The Complete Idiot's Guide to Chess It was published in 1997. It's had a great run. Um, the current instantiation is called How to Play Chess Like a Boss. Uh, that was a new branding uh, that was developed five years ago by the publisher, and it's been a complete flop. And uh, I believe the book, maybe the book has sold a couple thousand copies. I'm not really sure. Um, and the, like I said, the branding's terrible. But the new, the new version, How to Play Chess Like a Boss, like it's got all the like the chess instruction, which I, I'm proud of. I think it's a good basic sort of chess instruction book. But it also has a chapter in there in chess and AI, uh, well, chess and computers. But to update that chapter, I really put a lot of effort into um, doing the research and, and really describing what AI is, how it operates. Like, I feel like that's a really good chapter. And so I recommend, it is my book, take that as it is, but I recommend it highly. I think it's, um, I think it's a good description. And uh, I think um, many people, you know, if you're interested in chess and AI, I think you'll get a lot out of reading that. In terms of what's been happening over the last couple of years, it's obviously been an incredibly exciting time for AI. I don't think it's changed chess engines that much. Um, you know, like it's this sort of these these uh, large language models are the big thing in AI over the last couple of years. Um, and it's it's funny and interesting that a large language model that literally has nothing about no knowledge of the rules of chess 
but is simply using its large language model to predict chess moves through chess notation. It's taking it's taking chess notation as words and essentially predicting words. And it turns out that these engines, these large language models can play pretty good games, but they don't always predict legal moves. Mm. <laughs> so so it's a very funny. Um, but I don't think it has anything. I don't think it has much relevance for chess. Um, I just think, you know, obviously the engines just keep getting better. They're amazing. And um, and they continue to enrich the game. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. I think it's an exciting time for chess. Yeah. Well, well said. Um, well, Patrick, this has been fun. It's always great to get your perspective. And I appreciate uh, it. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting me, Ben. Sure. I'll take care. Thanks again. All right. Take, take, take care. Thank you.